I mean, is there something that stands out to you about these hero organisms like bees, silkworms? You mentioned E. coli has its pros and cons, this bacteria. What have you learned that small or big that's interesting about these organisms? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. What have I learned? I've learned that, um, you know, uh, we did. We also worked with shrimp shells with Agoja. We built this tower on the roof of SF MoMA, which by... Um, a couple of months ago, and until it was on the roof, we, we've shown the structure completely biodegrade into then, well, not completely, but almost completely biodegrade uh, mm -hmm. to the soil. And, um, and this notion that a product or part, an organism or part of that organism can reincarnate is very, very moving thought mm -hmm. to me uh, because I want to believe that I believe in reincarnation. I want to believe that, that I, I believe. Yeah, that's my relationship with with God. I want to. I want. I. I like to believe in believing. Most great things in life are um, second derivatives of things, mm. but <laughs> that's part of another conversation. I, I feel like that's a quote that's going to take weeks <laughs> to, to to really internalize. That that notion of I want you to want or mm. I need you to need or um, that 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 it, 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 there's always something a deeper truth behind what is on the surface, and mm -hmm. so I, I like to go to the second and tertiary derivative of things and and discover new truths about them through that. But what have I learned about organisms? And why don't you like E. coli? I like E. coli, uh, and and a lot of the work that we've done uh, was not possible without our, our working on E. coli or other workhorse organisms uh, like cyanobacteria. How are bacteria used? Death masks, <laughs> the death masks. So what are death masks? So we did this project called Vespers and those were basically death masks that was set as a process for designing a living product. What happens, and we looked at, I looked at, I remember looking at Beethoven's death mask and Agamemnon's death mask and just studying how they were created. And really they were sort of geometrically attuned to the face of the dead. And what we wanted to do is create a death mask that not was not based in the sh in was not based on the shape of of the of the wearer, but rather was based on their legacy and their biology. And maybe we could um, harness a few stem cells there for future generations, or contain the last breath. Lazarus, which preceded Vespers, was a project where we designed a mask to contain a single breath, the last breath of the wearer. Um, and again, if I had access to these technologies today, I would totally uh, reincorporate my grandmother's last breath in 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 a in, in a in a product. So it was like an air memento. So with Vespers, we um, we actually used E. coli uh, to um, to to create pigmented masks, masks whose pigments uh, would be recreated at the surface of the mask uh, and. I'm skipping over a lot of content, but basically there were 15 masks and they were created as three sets, the masks of the past, the masks of the present, and the mask of the future. Um, the masks, there were five, five, and five, and the masks of the past were based on um, ornaments and they were um, embedded with natural minerals like gold. Yes, yes, yes. And we're looking exactly. at pictures of these and they're yes. gorgeous. Yes. Um, extremely <sighs> delicate and interesting fractal patterns that are symmetrical. They look symmetrical, but they're not. This is intent. This is we intended for you to be tricked and think that they're all symmetrical. But, but there's imperfections. There are imperfections by design. Um, all of these, um, all of these forms and shapes and distribution of matter that you're looking at was. Uh, was entirely designed using a computational program. So none of it is manual. Um, but long story short, the first collection is about the surface of the mask. And the second collection, which you're looking at, is about the volume of the mask and 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 what happens to the mask when all the colors from the surface, yes, enter the volume of the mask inside, create pockets and channels to guide life through them. Mm -hmm. um, they were incorporated with pigment-producing living organisms, and then those organisms were 
templated to recreate the patterns of the original death masks. And so life recycles and rebegins and so on and so forth. The past meets the future, the future meets the past. Um, from the surface to the volume, from death to life to death to life to death to life. And that, again, is a recurring theme in, in, in the projects that, that we take on. But there, from a technological perspective, what was interesting is that we embedded chemical signals in the jet, in the printer, mm. and those chemical signals um, basically interacted with the um, pigment-producing bacteria, uh, in, in this case E. coli, um, that were introduced on the surface of the mask. And those interactions between the chemical signals inside the resins and the bacteria at the surface of the mask at the resolution that is native to the printer, in this case 20 microns um, per voxel, uh, allowed us to compute the exact patterns that we wanted to achieve. And we thought, well, it will, if, if we can do this with pigments, can we do this with antibiotics? If we can do this with antibiotics, could we do it with, with melanin? And what are the implications? Again, this is a platform technology. Now that we have it, what are the actual real-world implications and potential applications for this technology? Um, and we started a new area. One of my um, students, Rachel, her PhD thesis uh, was, was titled uh, after this new class of materials that we created through this project, Vespers, Hybrid Living Materials, HLMs. Um, and these hybrid living materials really paved the way towards a whole other set of products that we've designed, uh, like, um, like the work that we did with Melanine for, for the Mandela Pavilion that we presented at SFMOMA, um, where, again, we're using the same principles of templating, in this case, not silkworms and not bees, uh, but we're templating bacteria at a much, much, um, much uh, more finer resolution. And now instead of um, templating using, using a robot, we're templating using a printer. But compute is very, very much part of it. And the, what's nice about bacteria, of course, is that um, from an ethical perspective, I think there is a range, right? So at the end of the Silk Pavilion, I got an email from a professor in Japan who has been working on transgenic silk and said, well, if you did this, this create amazing silk pavilion. Why don't we create, um, um, you know, glow in the light silk dresses? And and in order to create this glow in the light uh, silk, we need to, um, you know, to 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 apply um, uh, genes that are taken from a spider to a silkworm. And this is what is known as a transgenic operation. And we said no. And that was for us a clear decision that no, we will work with these organisms as long as we know that what we are doing with them is not only better for humans, but it's also better for them. And, and again, just to remind you, we're, um, I forget the exact number, but it's around um, a thousand cocoons per single shirt mm -hmm. that are exterminated in, in India and China and we're in, in, in those sericulture industries uh, that are being abused. Now, yes, the, this organism, uh, this organism was was designed to serve the human species, and maybe we should, maybe it's time, you know, to. To, to retire that, uh, you know, that conception of, of organisms that are designed for a human-centric world or human-centric set of applications. I, I don't feel the same way about E. coli. Um, I, not that I'm agnostic, organism agnostic, but, but still, I believe there's so much for us to do on this planet with, um, with, with bacteria. And so in general, your design principle is to um, grow cool stuff as a byproduct of the organism flourishing. So not, yes. not using the organism. The win-win, the synergy. Win -win. A whole that's bigger than the sum of its parts. It's interesting. I mean, it's in, it just feels like a gray area where genetic modification of an organism, it just feels like, I don't know, if you, if you genetically modified me to make me glow in the light, Kind of, kind of like it. I think it. you have enough of an aura. Left. Aura, thank you. That was I was just <laughs> fishing for compliments. Thank you. I appreciate but you're it so much. Absolutely right. <laughs> okay. And by the way, the gray area is you know is where some of us like to live and and like to thrive, and and that's okay. And and thank goodness that there's so many of us that 
that like the black and white and that thrive in the black and white. Mm -hmm. My husband is a good example for that. <laughs> well, but just to clarify, in this case, you're also trying to thrive in the black and white in that you're saying yes. like, the silkworm is a beautiful, wonderful creature. Let us not modify it. Is that the idea? Or is it okay to modify a little bit as long as we can see that it benefits the organism as well as the final creation? Uh, so with silkworms, absolutely, let's not modify it genetically. Okay. Let's not modify it genetically. Um, and then some, because why did we? Why did we get there to begin with 4,000 years ago in the Silk Road? And and we should never get to a point where we evolve life for the service of mankind at the risk of these wonderful creatures um, across the kingdoms, across the kingdom of life. I don't think about the same kind of ethical range um, when I think about bacteria. Nevertheless, bacteria are pretty wonderful organisms. I'm That's moving awesome. to my second cup here. <laughs> take take two. This things are getting serious um, now. Bacteria are, yeah, for sure. 